Assalamualaikum and very good day. I'm Dr. Hidayah from the School of Civil Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. So first, I would like to welcome everyone to my lecture video. This video is for online learning for the course of Advanced Root Material. In this video, I will discuss on the Green Highway concept. Actually, the concept is quite massive. So in this lecture, we will focus on materials strategy. So stay with me. I hope this video will benefit you and others. In this video, we will discuss on the introduction to Green Highway concept, measurement tools of Malaysia Green Highway Index or MyGHI, materials strategies, warm mix asphalt, cool pavement or reflective pavement, and then finally on the recycle or waste materials in pavement. Okay, are you familiar with the keywords of green, sustainability, and recycle? So what are they? How can we relate of these keywords to promote green highway concept in road construction? So first, let's refer to what exactly sustainable development. So when we talk about sustainable development, it refers to the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And then what about a sustainable pavement? So basically, a sustainable pavement is a concept that achieves its specific engineering goals while on a broader scale, first, to meet the basic human needs and then second, it uses resources effectively and finally, it preserves or restores surrounding ecosystem. So sustainability is context sensitive and thus the approach taken is not universal but rather unique for each pavement application. So furthermore, a sustainable pavement as defined here is not yet fully achievable. Today, sustainability is like a goal that needs to be worked out and ultimately achieved at some point in the future as the best practices continue to evolve. Okay, next, what exactly Green Highway? So Green Highway is a conservation approach of a highway from planning, design and construction stages of roadway which combines transportation and ecological sustainability that will be useful to the transportation system, ecosystem and town development. Okay, if you refer to the Malaysia Highway Authority, the way they define the Green Highway is based on five aspects as you can see from the slide. But the first one is the watershed driven storm water management and then life cycle energy and emission reduction Recycle, reuse and renewable, conservation and ecosystem management, and finally the overall societal benefits. Okay, in order to better understand the concept of pavement sustainability, it is essential to consider the entire pavement life cycle as shown in the figure, which can be divided into the following phases. The first one is production of materials, pavement design construction, use phase, maintenance and preservation, and finally, end of its life. So for the material production, it includes all processes in the acquisition, for example, mining and crude oil extraction, and then processing, for example, refining, manufacturing, and mixing of the pavement materials. And then we have design, the design stage refers to the process of identifying the structural and functional requirements of a pavement for given site condition. For example, subgrade, climate, and existing pavement structure. And also the determination of the pavement structural composition and accompanying materials. It includes the new pavement, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. And then the construction stage which include all processes and equipments associated with the construction of the initial pavement. And next, the use phase. The use phase refers to the operation of the pavement and its interaction with vehicles, people and the environment. Next, the maintenance and preservation. So these are activities applied at various times throughout the life of the pavement that maintains its overall serviceability. And finally, the end of its life. The end of life of the pavement refers to the final disposition and subsequent reuse, processing, 
recycling of the pavement after it has reached the end of its useful life. Therefore, pavement sustainability covers many things and phases that related to the pavement life cycle. But in this lecture, the focus will be given to the materials strategy. Before we go into details about the material strategy in order to implement the pavement sustainability or green highway, let's have a look on the example of measurement tools that have been used in Malaysia in order to encourage the road industry to implement the green highway concept in the road construction. I know there are probably other methods of evaluation or measurement tools applied in other country, but I think this is a good example that really specific evaluate the practice of green highway. So this measurement tools called Malaysia Green Highway Index or MyGHI has been successfully developed by UTM and Malaysia Highway Authority. It's a collaboration work. So the development of this index has involved all the stakeholders and it's used to measure the level of greenness of a highway. This is to encourage the implementation of green highway practice among the stakeholders. Basically, my GHI covers the fundamental elements of green highway development that are suitable for the tropical region. The evaluation of the highway covers environmental approach throughout the planning, design and construction stages. Or we can say as a performance baseline standard for adopting the concept of green highway. So the parties involved are the government or policy maker, concession company and highway user. So overall, the benefits are expected to be delivered directly or indirectly to the transportation infrastructure, ecosystem, urban growth, public health and surrounding communities. Okay, this is the manual released by the Malaysia Highway Authorities. It's called Green Highway Index or MyGHI. So in this manual, there are five key elements considered for the evaluation which include social and safety, sustainable design and construction activities, energy efficiency, environmental and water management, and finally, the materials and technology. In this lecture, we will focus on the material and technology. What exactly we can contribute through this element? So, according to the manual, for the five elements, total points given is 310 points of the 100%. So, from this, 22% goes to the sustainable design and construction activities and then another 22% for the social and safety and 21% for the energy efficiency, 19% for the environmental and water management and finally 16% for the material and technology. So for each of the elements you can see here, there's a lot of criteria for the evaluation. So through the points given to the company or projects, it will then be certified at different level. It's either silver, gold, and the highest is platinum. So based on this recognition, it will promote more benefits to the company and also the project. Okay, what exactly they can offer for materials and technology? As you can see from the table, this element covers the innovation technology, reduce, reuse and recycle, economical materials and pavement, and also erosion control. Okay, so let's have a look on the criteria that related to material. Okay, as specified for the materials and technology, the first one for the innovation and technology, it consists of the use of industrial byproducts, application of soil stabilization, and the consideration made on cool pavement in order to reduce the heat island effect. And then in terms of reduce, reuse, and recycle, which in particular refer to the reuse and recycle of non-hazardous materials. And then the economical materials and pavement, which refers to the consideration in using local materials, pavement design life, and potential in using the recycled pavement. And then next, on the erosion control, which consider the efforts that involve green techniques such as replanting. Okay, to better explain the material strategies in pavement construction, this explanation will take the example of asphalt mixtures production and application. The asphalt material phase involves the extraction and processing of the raw materials 
transportation to the plant, the asphalt mixture design and proportioning, as well as the plant operations to the point where the material is placed in trucks for transportation to the project site. Okay, first, let's have a look on asphalt materials. The asphalt binder in asphalt materials carries much of the total environmental impact of the mixture because of the impact of petroleum acquisition and refining. The use of wrap or reclaimed asphalt pavement in asphalt replaces not only virgin aggregate, but the wrap binder is also reused as binder, at least in part of it, which could reduce the amount of conventional binder in the new asphalt. Therefore, the use of wrap in new asphalt reduces the need for conventional binder and aggregate obtained from the natural resources. And we know both non-renewables and finite materials. So some strategies for reducing the environmental impact of the asphalt mixture can be implemented in the highway project such as First, to reduce the virgin binder content in asphalt mixture through the increased use of wrap. However, impact on performance for different applications must be considered. And then extend the service life of asphalt materials through increased standard for greater compaction. Use of warm mix asphalt to improve compaction, better mixture design and proper use of polymers or recycled materials. Then other strategy is to improve efficiency of plant processes. This is to allow producing asphalt mixtures at desired quality, which is to achieve required volumetric properties, but with reduced energy consumption. And then to reduce transportation distance of all raw materials through the use of more local materials while maintaining target specification, quality requirements and expected performance. And then the final strategy is to reduce the need for transportation by using in-place recycling, such as full depth recycling and coal in-place recycling, plant recycling using wrap and greater use of local materials without compromising performance requirement. In addition to the general aggregate sustainability consideration described previously, it is important to consider the impact of aggregate properties such as aggregate grading, interaction with asphalt and other performance-related properties affecting durability and functionality and the use of recycled or waste materials on the sustainability of asphalt mixtures. These properties include shape, texture, and mechanical durability. One distress that significantly shortens the asphalt pavement life is moisture damage, which is amplified when water is able to penetrate the asphalt pavement matrix. So certain types of aggregates can carry a much greater risk of moisture damage than others. For example, lime and liquid anti-strip chemicals are two additives that can reduce the susceptibility of mixtures to moisture damage. So there are a few strategies for reducing environmental impact from aggregates used in asphalt pavement structure, which is include the first one, to reduce the use of virgin aggregate through increased use of recycle and waste material, and then increase aggregate and pavement durability, and also to increase pavement design life. And then second strategy is to reduce the impact of virgin aggregate acquisition and processing through the improved mining practices. And then finally, to reduce the impact of aggregate transportation through mode of choice, greater use of local materials without compromising the performance requirement and optimally located construction stagging and processing areas. Aggregate make up the largest share and volume in pavement structure, whether it is used without a binding material, such as in unbound sub-base or base material, or as part of the asphalt layer. Even though aggregates are relatively low cost and have a low environmental impact per unit mass, relative to other materials that are used in pavements, they can have a significant impact on pavement sustainability because they are consumed in such large quantities. Aggregate use in unbound bases and sub-bases may be derived from natural resources or may be manufactured or derived from recycled pavement materials or other suitable demolition material. 
So from a sustainability perspective, it is convenient to combine manufactured aggregate with recycled materials into a recycled co-products or waste materials category. For example, wrap or reclaimed asphalt pavement is the most often produced when existing asphalt layers are coal mill as part of rehabilitation or maintenance overlay. And the removed material stockpile for use in new asphalt pavement, base or sub-base while the predominant use is in new asphalt pavement. And then next, we have Recycled Concrete Aggregate or RCA. RCA is created when concrete is purposely crushed to create aggregate for the use in sub-base, base or in asphalt or concrete application. RCA often contains previously cement that produces increased stiffness in bases or sub-bases when mixed with water that creates a material with superior properties compared with the virgin aggregates. When used as a base or sub-base, both the coarse and fine RCA are normally used. So other than these two examples of recycled aggregate, there are many more out there depending on local availability. Next is the strategies under asphalt mixture design and production. So when we talk about asphalt mixture design and production, we need to find the balance between specifying the use of higher quality materials, which often have higher initial cost and environmental impact, and the use of lower quality, lower cost materials with a lower environmental impact but potential for performance reduction. That's why when we discuss about the strategies, the entire life cycle must be considered not only from the economic perspective, but also from environmental perspective. The major sustainability-related challenge facing materials for asphalt pavement is that the production of asphalt is energy and greenhouse gases emission intensive. Reductions in those energy and emissions level are best achieved by expanding efforts to reduce the amount of asphalt needed over time. This can be achieved significantly by reducing the virgin binder content and extending the life of asphalt mixtures. Other approaches for improving the sustainability of materials for asphalt pavements include the use of less virgin aggregate and reducing the environmental impacts of mixing, transporting and placing asphalt mixtures. And then next, a reduction in material quantities through improvements in mixture design, construction practices and in some cases new materials such as warm mix asphalt inclusion of polymers, rubber, and other modifiers. Okay, next strategy to greater use of recycled, co-product, and waste materials including wrap and others to reduce the mining, extraction, manufacture, and transport of non-renewable virgin materials provided that performance is not compromised. For individual projects, this requires analysis of whether suitable materials are locally available because long transportation distance may reduce the energy and environmental benefits of using these materials. And then, greater use of locally available pavement materials provided that those benefits are not offset by reduced performance. For asphalt materials, locally available aggregates are the primary consideration. And finally, development of alternatives, namely bio-based alternatives to non-renewable feedstock such as petroleum. The environmental, economic and social impacts of producing these alternatives will need to be evaluated to determine their overall feasibility. If we talk about material strategies in green highway concept, there is another interesting term called eco-friendly materials. So what exactly this term is all about? Eco-friendly materials are products or services that have less or reduced effect on human health and the environment. In other words, they have been designed to do the least possible damage to the environment. So basically, we are talking about two main issues. The first one is the least possible environmental damage and the second one is the comparative skill as there are very few materials that are completely eco-friendly. One more point to note when we talk about eco-friendly construction is that it consists of two parts, the material itself and the technique used. A material by itself can be eco-friendly, for example, the application of bamboo, 
or even the conventional materials can become eco-friendly based on the construction technique that is used. So how to identify whether that material is considered as eco-friendly materials? There are various properties of eco-friendly building materials. For example, if you can see from the slide, the first one, it should be obtained from a renewable source. It can be biodegradable, local availability, it can be reused or recycled, has a good durability and lifespan, and of course, contribute to the reduction in air, land and water pollution. Materials can also be eco-friendly if they can assist in the reduction of the energy used in the structure during operation and maintenance. However, it is difficult to get a material that has all these properties and it does become a comparative assessment to identify whether that is eco-friendly materials. Okay, next, let's discuss on how the asphalt materials and production contribute to the green highway concept. This is based on what I've mentioned previously through the reduction of temperature, energy usage and emission. As we know, the production of asphalt mixture evolved from hot to warm mixed asphalt and then to half warm mixed asphalt and finally on cold mixed asphalt which benefit for various applications. Okay, this figure shows how the full range of techniques from cold mix asphalt through to hot mix asphalt produced at various temperature and energy consumption. As you can see from the figure, if we start to look from the hot mix asphalt, the mixture is produced and mixed at very high temperatures, roughly between 150 to 190 degrees Celsius. The production temperatures of hot mix asphalt depends on the bitumen used, meaning that the harder the bitumen, the more the heat that we need to soften the bitumen. And then, with the new invention of materials and additives, they have come up with warm mix asphalt, which is produced and mixed at temperature roughly between 100 to 150 degrees Celsius. And then we have half warm mix asphalt, which is produced between approximately 70 to 100 degrees Celsius. And finally, the invention of cool mix asphalt, which is produced with unheated aggregate and bitumen emulsion or foam bitumen. So among these four types of asphalt mixtures, the warm mix asphalt and hot mix asphalt are the most established material in paving application. Both can be compared because they are purposely designed to perform with the same function. But one of them provide more benefits compared to the other one, which is warm mix asphalt. In this lecture, we are going to focus on the warm mix asphalt as an example of alternative asphalt production by adopting the green highway concept. For example, the lower mixing and paving temperatures obtained by the use of warm mix asphalt minimize the fume, emission, and creates cooler working condition for the asphalt workers. As a rule of thumb, the release of fume is reduced by around 50% for each 12 degrees Celsius reduction in temperature. This reduction of emission is the most important reason for the asphalt industry to stimulate the use of warmest asphalt. And for this reason, why the warmest asphalt technology is adopted in the green highway strategies. In general, the asphalt industry is constantly attempting to reduce its emission as concerns are growing on global warming. As shown here in the photo that compares the production between the hot and warm is asphalt, which can be clearly observed that less smoke or emissions produced for the warm is asphalt. This is done by decreasing the mixing and compaction temperatures of asphalt mixtures without affecting the properties of the mix, which is possible through numerous available technologies in the industry. So basically, it involves less energy consumption, lower mixing and compaction temperatures, early site opening, reduced aging, fewer emissions, allow for cold weather paving, and better walkability. Okay, this slide compares the production range of warm mix asphalt for various types of additives, such as foam asphalt, chemical additives, and wax-based additive. So how does it work? Warm mix asphalt technologies reduce 
reduce the viscosity of asphalt binder so that the aggregates can be coated at lower temperatures. The key is the addition of the additives to the asphalt mix. The additives allow the asphalt binders and aggregate to be mixed at the lower temperatures. So the most common techniques, it's either using the organic additives, chemical additives or foaming techniques. Okay, let's have a look on the benefits of this technology. The most important benefit of using warm mix asphalt is the significant lower asphalt fume exposure level during paving operations compared to hot mix asphalt. This lower exposure level supports the goal of the asphalt industry in order to reduce asphalt fumes during paving operations to improve the working environment of the asphalt workers. And the second reason is the energy reduction, which is referred to the lower emission of greenhouse gases and production cost. Okay, in terms of the asphalt workers' benefit, the lower mixing and paving temperatures minimize the fume emissions and creates cooler working condition for the asphalt workers. And then for the environmental benefits, it refers to the reduction of the production temperature in the warm mix asphalt that leads to significant reduction of stack emissions. And then the reduced fuel and energy usage gives a reduction of the production of greenhouse gases and reduce the CO2 or carbon footprint. Okay, next, in terms of the manufacturing and paving benefits. Okay, for the manufacturing benefits, lower asphalt temperatures results in less hardening of the asphalt or binder during manufacture. And then the lower production temperatures reduce the thermal stress on the plant components and the production of warm mix asphalt is fully compatible with the use of reclaimed asphalt pavement. And for the paving operation benefit, warm mix asphalt can be compacted at lower temperature than hot mix asphalt and allow for extended time for the paving operation. Other than that, it will cool faster to the ambient temperatures and therefore, the site can be open for traffic at earlier stage. See, that's a lot of benefits, right? And very important technology for sustainability in pavement. Okay, next we move to another technology or material strategy in pavement that adopt the concept of green highway which is called cool pavement. Cool pavements include a range of established and emerging technologies as the heat island reduction efforts. The term currently refers to paving materials that reflect more solar energy and then enhance water evaporation or modify to remain cooler than the conventional pavements. Conventional paving materials can reach peak summertime temperatures of 48 to 67 degrees Celsius, transferring excess heat to the air above them. Due to the large area covered by the pavements in urban areas, there are important elements to be considered in heat island mitigation. Cool pavements can be created with existing paving technologies such as for asphalt and concrete and also newer approaches such as the use of coatings or grass paving. So basically, it's a road surface that uses additives to reflect more solar radiation compared to the conventional dark pavement. So for conventional dark pavements, they contribute to urban heat island as they absorb 80 to 95% of sunlight and warm the local air. So cool pavements are made with different materials to increase albedo and to reflect the short wave radiation out of the atmosphere. Therefore, by increasing albedo, it will reduce the heat transfer to the surface and can cause local cooling if the scale of the albedo reduction is sufficiently large. Based on the previous reports, they found that if pavement reflectance throughout a city will increase from 10 to 35%, the air temperature could potentially be reduced by almost 1 degree Celsius. For example, the existing dark pavement can be coated with white topping or by adding reflective coats or seal to increase the albedo value. Others for new pavement, it can be constructed to increase albedo by using modified mixes, permeable pavements and vegetated pavements. So before we go into details on the potential materials strategy for the cool pavements, let's discuss what exactly urban heat island. 
Okay, in this slide, we're going to discuss about what exactly the heat island effect and what are the impacts and causes of the heat islands and what are the potential mitigation measures. In general, the term heat island effect describes the characteristic warmth of both the atmosphere and the surfaces in developed urban areas compared to the surrounding or the nearby underdeveloped suburban due to the human activities. It was stated that this phenomenon contributes about 30% to the climate warming. The heat island sketch pictured in the slide shows how urban temperatures are typically lower at the urban rural border than in downtown areas. The graphic also shows how parks, open land and bodies of the water can create cooler areas within a city. So how this phenomenon can give impact to the environment? The elevated temperature from urban heat island can affect the community's environment and quality of life such as in terms of how they compromise in terms of human health and comfort. For example, the increase in daytime temperature of both pavement and near surface air reduce nighttime cooling and higher air pollution levels can affect human health by contributing to general discomfort and heat stroke. And then it will also increase the energy usage. The increased summertime temperatures in cities will potentially increase the energy demand for building cooling in hot regions or we can say higher demand for electricity. And then the urban heat island also will increase emission of air pollutants and greenhouse gases. As described before, urban heat islands raise demand for electrical energy in summer. So companies that supply electricity will try to meet much of this demand which in turn leads to an increase in air pollutants and greenhouse gases emissions. The major pollutants from fossil fuel power plants include sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, carbon monoxide and mercury. So these pollutants are harmful to human health and also contribute to the global climate change. Next, the urban heat island phenomenon can impact the water quality. The high pavement surface temperature can hit the stormwater runoff. And previous studies have shown that pavements that are at 38 degrees Celsius can increase the initial rainwater temperature from roughly 20 degrees Celsius to over 35 degrees Celsius. This heated stormwater runoff will increase the water body temperatures if it drains into stream, rivers, pond and lake. Okay, next, it will affect the pavement life. So, pavement temperatures can have significant influence on pavement durability. For example, the asphalt pavement in hot climate, the high temperature can significantly increase the risk of rutting or we can say permanent deformation, potential of aging and cracking if it's not designed well. And for the concrete pavements, high temperature and temperature gradient can significantly increase the probability of cracking that caused by the thermal stress. Okay, this slide shows the thermal images captured using thermal imaging camera for the asphalt pavement and the image shows that conventional pavement can contribute a lot to the heating of the surrounding. So this proves that something needs to be done for the pavement itself to mitigate this problem. As you can see from the image, the hot surface of the black asphalt is captured with higher temperature compared to the surrounding and the lowest temperatures are captured for the vegetative surrounding. So how to combat this problem? There are several potential strategies to make pavements cooler with different cooling mechanisms, which can be classified into four different categories. The first one is the modification of thermal properties of pavement materials. So this is kind of interesting features for the material research, especially for paving materials. And then enhancement of evaporation from pavements, enhancement of convection, and finally on the reduction of heat energy on or within the pavements. So among these four categories, we're going to focus on the modification of thermal properties of the pavement materials. The thermal behavior of pavements is largely dependent on the thermal properties of pavement materials, including thermal conductivity, specific heat capacity, 
density, solar reflectivity such as albedo, thermal emissivity and permeability. So with appropriate modification of these properties could help keep the pavements and near surface air cooler. Okay, let's start with the pavement thermal conductivity. Thermal conductivity is the ability of materials to conduct or transmit heat. It determines how fast the heat would be conducted from a high temperature object to a low temperature object. Pavements with low thermal conductivity may heat the surface but will not transfer the heat throughout the other pavement layers as quickly as pavement with higher thermal conductivity. Therefore, reducing thermal conductivity of pavements could slower the heat flow into pavements under solar radiation and high air temperatures. And finally, reduce the temperatures of pavements and near surface air. Okay, next is the increment of pavement surface reflectance. Solar reflectance or albedo is the percentage of solar energy reflected by a surface. Most existing studies on cool pavements have focused on solar reflectance. High albedo also could help to reduce pavement subsurface temperatures because less heat is available at the surface to then be transferred into the pavement layers below the surface. Many opportunities exist to improve this property of materials due to the simplicity and convenience of reflectivity improvement for both new and existing surfaces of asphalt and concrete pavements. Okay, next point is to increase the pavement thermal emissivity. A material's thermal emissivity determines how much heat will be radiated per unit area at a given temperature and that is how much a surface emits heat. Thermal emissivity plays a role in determining a material's contribution to heat island. Research suggests albedo and emissivity have the greatest influence on how a conventional pavement cools down or heat up, with albedo having a large impact on maximum surface temperatures and emissivity affecting minimum temperatures. Similar to albedo, if the increased radiation from pavements directly goes out back into the space far away with very little absorbed by the air, it might help reduce heat island. And then finally, increase in terms of permeability of the pavement. So runoff generated from impermeable street, road and highways are among these non-point sources that contain large amount of inorganic and organic pollutants. To protect the quality of the receiving waters, regulations have been established to treat the runoff before discharging or to reduce the pollutants at the source. Permeable pavements contain more voids than conventional impermeable pavements and it is designed to allow water to drain through the surface into the sublayers and then to infiltrate into the ground below. The example of permeable pavements include porous asphalt pavement, pervious concrete pavements, interlocking concrete pavements and various types of gravel pavements. Okay, let's have a look on various efforts taken to mitigate the heat island problems. These are some of the methods applied to reduce the heat island effect or reduce the temperature of the surrounding, specifically the pavements like this one, its permeable pavement, with the porous structure and allow the water to infiltrate and cool the pavement structure. And then next to it, we have surface coating of different colors such as green, yellow and white. So by having these colors as coating on the asphalt pavement, it will reflect more heat compared to the black color of asphalt, which normally absorb more heat. And then we have colored asphalt. Adding color to asphalt pavement has become very popular in recent years. One of the methods used is involve adding dry pigment to the hot asphalt. But this method is a bit costly compared to the surface coating. Okay, next, let's have a look on the benefit of cool pavement. First, of course, in terms of the reduction in energy usage. The energy usage is reduced as local temperatures are cool. So lower temperatures allow air conditioners to cool buildings with less energy. And then the improvement in terms of air quality. Because a reduction in energy usage would lower greenhouse emission and air pollution. Previous studies in 
2007 has estimated that an increase of global pavement albedo of 35 to 39% could reduce carbon dioxide emission worth about 400 billion US dollar and finally increase the quality of life because lower temperatures reduce heat related illness and then permeable pavements can enhance safety because better drainage reduces water spray from moving vehicles and increase visibility by draining water that increases glare okay next we have a look on another strategy in applying green highway concept which is the use of recycle by products or waste materials in pavement in general more production equals more waste and more waste creates environmental concern so an economical viable solution to this problem should include utilization of waste material for new products which in turn minimize the heavy burden of the landfills through recycling it saves natural resources or less dependence on natural materials save energy reduce solid waste reduce air and water pollutants and also reduce the greenhouse gases the construction industry can start being aware of and take advantage of the benefits of using waste materials or recycled materials especially in these recent years studies have been investigated the use of acceptable waste recycle and reusable materials and methods for example the use of glass plastic scrap tires asphalt pavement and concrete aggregate in construction is becoming increasingly popular due to shortage and increasing cost of raw materials from natural resources Waste management today is a complex topic and the operational practices of transporting and processing waste differ widely between cities and nations. However, efforts have been made to minimize the problem and build a framework that divides the broad types of waste management into a system as shown in the slide. This system covers the entire life cycle of a product and extract the maximum potential benefits from any waste. As a result, types of waste management are usually split into three categories based on reduce, reuse, and recycle. At the very top of the chain, the prevention of waste should be the priority and the most sustainable and favorable option. Therefore, the concept of recycling has been a significant option in the road construction, maintenance, and rehabilitation. This is applies when the road agencies try to use the crumb rubber obtained from scrap tires for asphalt modification and the use of reclaimed asphalt pavement for hot or cold in place recycling for road maintenance. So the use of recycle or waste materials does significant to the highlighted issues. Okay, this can be a good example on the need of alternative materials over the conventional. For example, In cement production for 1 ton cement it produces around 1 ton carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and this type of greenhouse gas contributes a lot to the global warming so this proves that finding alternative materials over the conventional material is vital for green practices in the construction industry As you can see from the slide, various recycled byproducts or waste materials are potentially used in the paving works and relevant to the green highway concept that we are talking about. For example, we have in the category of industrial and domestic. Within the category of industrial such as rice husk, steel slag, bottom and fly ash from the coal combustion. And then for the domestic waste, we have scrap tires which is processed into crumb rubber, glass, plastic and waste oil which i do believe some of them we have discussed in the previous lecture. Okay, first let's have a look on the reclaimed asphalt pavement as an example of recycled material used in road construction. Reclaimed asphalt pavement or wrap is defined as removed existing pavement materials containing asphalt and aggregates. Existing asphalt pavement materials are normally removed during resurfacing work, rehabilitation or reconstruction operations. Once removed and processed, the pavement materials become wrap which contains a valuable asphalt binder and aggregate. When properly crushed and screened, wrap consists of highly quality material, well-graded aggregates, 
coated with asphalt binder. So using wrap material, Haswell recognized financial as it reduces the need of virgin aggregate and the amount of new asphalt binder and for the environmental benefits. So the Green Highway supports and promotes the use of recycled highway materials in pavement construction, which is an effort to preserve the natural environment, reduce waste and provide a cost-effective material for construction of highways. The most common wrap used in pavement is in the type of hot mix asphalt. There's a lot of evidence that hot mix asphalt which incorporates wrap performs as well as hot mix asphalt without wrap. It is also used as a granular base or sub-base, stabilized base aggregate and embankment or fill material. In fact, the primary objective is to encourage the use of recycled materials in the construction of highways to the maximum economical and practical extent possible with equal or improved performance. As part of the recycled materials policy, the road industries are actively promotes asphalt pavement recycling and technology. There are three key requirements that must be satisfied for asphalt pavement recycling to be successful. Recycled asphalt pavement must be cost effective, environmentally responsible and perform well. There are various of recycling techniques that use strap as paving materials. First is the coal in place recycling, CIPR. CIPR essentially pulverizes the existing pavement structure to a predetermined depth and then add a binding agent such as emulsion or foam as fault and then lays and compact the resulting product for the use as stabilized base cost. This base cost is then paved with as fault for the surface cost. And then we have in place hot mix asphalt recycling, HIPR. Usually HIPR can only correct shallow surface distress problem of less than 2 inches. HIPR can be done by heating the pavement surface, scarified and then rejuvenated using additive to improve the recycled asphalt binder viscosity and then mix and level and finally compacted using the conventional compaction equipment. In some cases, it requires additional aggregate to improve the strength or stability. And then next, we have coal plant mix recycling, which is involved mixing wrap with emulsion or foam asphalt at plant facility. A rejuvenating agent can be added to improve the recycled asphalt binder viscosity and new aggregates can also be added to improve the overall performance. The resulting coal mix is typically used as a stabilized base cost. Since coal-in-place recycling has become more common, coal plant mixing has become less popular. And then we have full depth reclamation. This is a form of CIPR where the entire pavement structure is pulverized and recycled. And then the HMA overlay is placed on top of the recycled material. This is the photo of wrap which contain the edge binder and fine aggregate. When planning to use wrap in road construction, there are few considerations that need to be made. Wrap usually contains between 3 to 7% asphalt by weight. In general, the asphalt binder in wrap will be more viscose than virgin asphalt binder due to aging effects. Therefore, if enough wrap is added to the asphalt mixture, a softer virgin asphalt binder should be used to balance the properties of the mix. And then after milling or crushing, wrap gradation is generally finer than the virgin aggregate because of the degradation that occurs during removal and processing. Therefore, more wrap is suitable to be added in the base courses compared to the surface courses. These are some photos of CIPR paving works where the defect area is mill and the material is rejuvenated and stabilized before paving back as stabilized base. Okay, next we have glass as example of waste material used in asphalt. Annually, it's about 2 million tons of glass container are disposed and this create a disposal problem as the number of waste glass increases. Previously, there is a product that has been developed for asphalt containing glass which is called glass fault. In this mix, the glass is used to replace the aggregate portion. 
the waste glass is crushed and screened and then used as a portion of fine aggregate between 10 to 15% in wearing costs. However, the use of more than 15% of waste glass can cause stripping problem to the asphalt binder. Previous study also found that glass can be used up to 25% for base or binder cost. The glass doesn't absorb the bitumen which make it a hydrophilic characteristic. However, it prones to moisture damage which can cause the stripping and raveling problem due to loss of addition. Okay, next, let's have a look on detailed characteristic of glass. For example, the first one in terms of the gradation, where smaller glass particles and lower percentage of glass are recommended when doing any modification for asphalt mixture. And then for the specific gravity, the glass has approximately 10 to 15% below the conventional aggregates. And then durability. Glass is a brittle material and to have it in coarse particle will break the glass during handling. So that's why the finer size is more preferred. In terms of frictional properties, the skid resistant tested for the mixture containing glass was found to comply with the standard. And then mix stability, the angular shape of the glass and high friction angle contributes to the good lateral stability. And then in terms of stripping resistance, the glass is not absorptive and addition with asphalt binder is very poor. Therefore, it needs for anti-stripping agent for at least 2% hydrated lime. Okay, next on reflectivity. Based on previous study, they have found that the use of glass content in asphalt mixture greater than 15% by weight will increase the pavement reflectivity. And finally, the glass has low thermal conductivity which enhance the heat retention in the mixes. Okay, next we have plastic waste. So plastic waste can be mixed in the asphalt mixture as part of the aggregates or as modifier in the binder. From previous studies, the use of modified asphalt binder with the addition of processed plastic 8% by weight of the asphalt binder will improve the stability or strength, fatigue life in comparison to the use of conventional asphalt binder and then its application in dry process by mixing the plastic with aggregate has produced better performance compared to the conventional asphalt mix. Okay, next on the example of waste material used in asphalt mixture is waste engine or cooking oil. These waste oils have a potential to be used as rejuvenators for restoring the desirable properties of the aged wrap binder to produce very high content wrap in hot mix asphalt. So basically, the oils could soften the aged wrap. Okay, next is the coal ash. Coal ash is the mineral residue resulting from the combustion of powdered coal in power generating plants. So basically, it consists of fly ash and bottom ash. In Malaysia, we have a quite number of coal-fired power plants for the generation of electricity with high capacity. If we refer to each power plant itself, the production of coal ash can be approximately 18,000 tons per day of coal burning and out of that figure, 180 tons is the bottom ash and the rest is the fly ash. And it should be noted that this is generated on a daily basis which creates shortage in landfill areas. So how the coal ashes are obtained from the coal combustion? As you can see from the slide, the burning process takes place in the furnace or boiler. Fly ash, also known as flu ash, is a residue generated in coal combustion and comprises the fine ash particles that rise within the flue gases. And then, the bottom ash is a coarser ash that is made from ash particles that are too large to be carried in the flue gases and fall through the open gates to the ash hopper at the bottom of the furnace. That's why it's called bottom ash. So what are the unique properties of these coal ashes? For the fly ash, it constitutes about 
85% to 90% of the overall ashes. The flat ash consists mostly of silicon dioxide, aluminum oxide and iron oxide. It's pozzolanic in nature, reacts with calcium hydroxide to form cementitious compound. And that's why it has been used to replace up to 50% of the Portland cement for the concrete production and also improve workability and pumpability of concrete. Others, it shows less bleeding and provides self-leveling and self-compacting of the backfill material. And then for the bottom edge, these particles are quite porous and they have been used a lot as lightweight aggregate to produce a lightweight concrete blocks. The density of some bottom edge is less than half that of the conventional aggregate and the concrete blocks will be much lighter and just as strong. Okay, this slide shows the various application of the coal ash in the construction industry in the US and the highest application is for structural fills embankment, road base and sub base, in concrete and also asphalt. And then in the UK, the coal ash is utilized in the brick manufacturing. So many applications in using this material have been exempted from waste management licensing for the cause of promoting the use of fly ash and bottom ash. And approvals are given based on case-by-case -case basis where the contractor wishing to utilize fly ash and bottom ash have to submit their proposals including the environmental risk assessment for approval. And then in Europe, Japan and China, the main application is in the concrete industry, including the production of lightweight concrete block. Okay, finally, I would like to highlight a few unresolved issues or uncertainties in the application of waste materials in pavement. First, in terms of documentation and specification. This is very important before any application or production is made in large scale. And then, in terms of life cycle cost, and cost-benefit analysis for the potential material which include the initial and maintenance cost for the long-term run. And then the issue of lack of field data to evaluate the performance or fluctuations in the performance due to different locations of trial or climatic conditions and limited information on its effectiveness over the conventional materials. Next, detailed study should also include not only on the performance but also in terms of the environmental and economical perspective and then whether the application of that particular waste materials require any plants or equipment modifications for example whether it needs a storage tank a binder pump or anything during the blending process then expertise of the contractor and workers health and safety issues especially when dealing with the emissions. Okay, as a conclusion, waste material should not be used as a standard practice until the performance data is available for the field projects. The best evaluation is that the materials can perform similar or better than the conventional material. Okay, that's all for Green Hive Concept, specific for the materials strategy. Thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video. Assalamualaikum.